Hello friends, welcome you all to the 26th session of Home Development. So in this uh, discussion we will be covering what are this leftover some more on the cache memory organization. Um, some of the detailed elements which we have not touched upon so far in detail, uh, I will do that in this lecture and then we will specifically see how cache is controlled in a um, uh, inside an ARM system. Okay. So, I mentioned that some design elements need to be covered right, well, what are the design elements? Suppose you are designing a cache, what are different parameters we have to speak to come up with a final design okay. So, there are so many input configurations possible based on that we design the cache and then we get a final design of cache and which we will be integrating with the processor okay in our case it is the ARM processor and then we will be integrating it with the ARM sorry about this okay and then later on this will also be connected to the memory controller or it could be memory may be inside or it, it will be outside. So, we will be designing a cache okay there are so many ways we can design it and uh, so what are the design elements we will be covering it in this class as well as I will tell you how do we control it okay suppose okay let me a little bit uh, maybe when I come to the co-processor I will talk about that. So, that will give you how we control the cache inside a processor okay. So, that is that is going to be our focus. So, with this discussion um, we will be uh, completing the cache related discussion and then we will continue with the virtual memory management from next uh, lecture onwards ok. Ok, what is the block replacement ok, um, if you if you all remember the basic cache design let me again give you some introduction you know the as a kind of a reminder. So, based on the size you know that this is the main memory and uh, this is cache ok. So, processor is somewhere here ok, our, our, our processor arm is here. <coughs> now, let us assume ok this main memory and this cache size ok this uh, is of 16 words ok just for a uh, discussion say ok. So, this is 16 words are there in this ok, one word is 4 bytes ok, ok. Now, this is also we have 16 words assume that we know that each uh, cache you know, is uh, storing it in blocks. So, we are assuming now each block is of size 4 bytes ok. Let me write it as capital B so that you know that it is not a bit it is byte. So, 4 bytes of block that is we consider 4 byte as one word and then and we are designing we have a system ok it is it is not practical to have only you know 16 uh, words of a cache, but just for a you know, uh, discussion purpose ok. So, how many blocks are there 0 to 15 blocks are there ok. And then let us assume there are 4 such 16 words ok, each one of them are 16 words ok. So, how many totally 32 uh, you know, so this 16 32 then this, this 64, so 64 words or 64 into 4 bytes of main memory ok, only this much is there. Now, each of this 16 words each can be divided into words right, in each of them are all of them are accessed in terms of words. So, let me give you a different uh, blocks in a color ok, this is one block 
not one block this is a this size is equivalent to the cash size okay the whole thing is equivalent to the size of the cash now what are we trying to do we have uh, a main memory which is four times bigger than the cash okay naturally main memory will be more than that so it is four times bigger than the cash now we are trying to see how we can be mapped so uh, just to refresh on your uh, you know yesterday's class uh, last uh, session let me tell you how this is done okay now one thing i showed you direct mapping that means what whatever so this first block word here uh, word is a block so first block of that memory is mapped to this okay first block similarly the first block of this is mapped to the same location so every say once the main memory is there and your cache is there what do you do you divide this main memory into the equal size of the cache okay if suppose 16 words are there you divide it into 16 words so it should be a multiple okay first of all the main memory should be multiple of the cache size okay first point done then once you do that then you can have the same number of blocks in the each of those uh, division you know, sessions i will call it as maybe you know, uh, a session one session okay so each session will have the same number of blocks that are there in the cache now direct mapping does what does it do it just maps the every block into the same location so that means this first block will be mapped to the first block of this and this first block will be mapped to this first block of this. so now if we are talking about a replacement policy okay why do we need replacement because we have a limited cache memory and then once we are done with this and then we want to get a new uh, block from the memory we want to place you no know, we want to see where we can place it so in a, in the case of direct mapping when we are uh, doing a direct mapping what happens that the location where each block in the main memory is supposed to come and sit in the cache is already fixed if it is lying in the first one it will come to the first location now if it is in the second location of the session it will come to the second block of the cache so it is one to one mapping but multiple sessions are mapped to this one cache so how do you decide the replacement suppose you want to get a new block from here which happens to be a third block in this do you have any uh, freedom to choose any thing, any other block other than the third block you cannot because you know the mapping is done through hardware okay please remember it is not done at the tie you know like a software programmable some things are done but you no know, once you decide the mapping it is going to be fixed for the particular execution so this is going to be the mapping so you don't have any choice other than removing the block which is already there in this location okay you know if it happens to be different only you are trying to bring this or if uh, earlier also this same block was sitting in the cache you won't be you know considering it as a cache mate and you won't come to the main memory but when it there is uh, miss that means other than this block some other block either this uh, okay or uh, this or the third block here is in the cache one of them may be in the cache so we we have to evict this put it back into main memory and then bring a new new block into this location so the location where we are getting this block is already predefined based on which block you want to bring it into the cache this is the case for direct mapping okay let us for you know in the, in the same place i will uh, explain you the other mappings also okay now let us see if it is going to be a some other thing okay uh, let me take a different color now suppose if it is a um okay let me erase this mapping okay fully associated suppose if you consider it as a fully associated okay that means what any block in the cache in the main memory can come in occupy any place in the cache assume that the design is same okay 16 blocks are there and then here also the same 64 into uh, 64 blocks are here okay and in the main memory so we can this is organized in such a way that we can bring any block in the main memory to any location in the cache that means you can pick anything here to you no know, evict it and then bring it here bring the new block here 
it doesn't matter it, it is not tied to a particular location that is what is fully associated ok. So, you know that it is uh, now we, we maintain the remaining address of that you uh, know main memory in the tag as a tag and then locate which location of which main memory block is in the cache. So, we will search through the tag and then find out. So, that is fully associative. What about set associative? It is a another uh, method of mapping the cache. So, assume that I have I am adding one more of the same 16 words ok 0 to 15 you know, I have added one more here that means it is two set associative ok two set. If it is four set associative what I have done I would have as I added four more uh, two more that means totally there will be four then it will be equivalent to how many you have in the main memory there, there is no point in in this case having a four set associative for this kind of a main memory correct. So, if it is two set associative it is actually we have a half the size of the main memory here in the tag. So, in this case what happens either this or the, uh, suppose you are talking about the first block any one of this first block can be in one of these two locations ok. So, in this case what happens if suppose we are saying that ok we are trying to get this block but this block and this block are in the occupying this first locations of the cache. Now, you have to decide after coming to that particular cache line or a block we have to evict one of these two ok. Then it is a choosing between two of the blocks which one to be evicted. So, that is the replacement policy. So, in case of set associative we have a restricted set or restricted blocks to consider, but it is better than the previous one it is not that only you know the we identify only one block and that needs to be evicted. Now, we have we can choose one of them whichever is being used more often we can retain it and then other one we can choose uh, to, to re-evict. So, we are talking about based on the different mappings the replacement algorithm will change that is what I try to explain here ok. I hope this is clear to you it is a you know, recap of what we discussed in the last class. So, let us go forward. So, no alternatives in case of direct mapping I told you in direct mapping what happens the particular block which needs to be brought into the cache exactly comes to a particular location in the cache. So, we do not have any choice other than everything that earlier already occupying you know in the cache whatever is there in the block that needs to be thrown out ok. Thrown out in the sense it should be written back to main menu. In two way associative the option is to choose one of the entry I told you ok. So, suppose we have two set associative means two, two entries like this suppose this block is coming equivalently the same block in one of this we can be chosen ok we have an option here. So, what is the advantage of having an option ok let me explain. See when you have an option to choose ok you can place one of the block which is coming from main memory into one of the places in the cache that is what I am saying in two way associated set two set ok two way here two ok two way set associative here I can choose either this or this. So, what is the advantage see we can add some more attributes to each block in the cache ok to maintain the access suppose you see how do you decide a block is to be maintain in the cache or not ok. It is based on the usage pattern who decides the usage pattern the program which is being executed by the proper. So, based on the program sequence and whether it is a data or either instruction does not matter whether it is a loop or you know it, it, it depends on the control flow of the program and then what is being executed based on that we might have some more hits happening ok to a block ok in the cache. So, what I mean by a block in the cache see when you have a two way set associative there are two different part of the main memory is in the cache ok. Let me change the color to say see assume that this is mapping to this. So, it is sitting here 
and then another okay let me choose a, a different color so that you will find some difference here so another block is here okay it could be a data or insertion doesn't matter okay so let us for a try you know for a simplicity uh, for our discussion sake we let us assume that this is some data d1 and d2 and based on the color maybe this is d2 and uh, this is d d1 is in the cache now based on the program sequence either d1 may be accessed more often or d2 we don't know assuming that i showed more arrows here so assuming that d2 is are uh, used more often that means in the program for loop there is a you know variable i which has been mapped to some register r2 and then that r2 happens to be in this block the, the variable i happens to be in this block and which has come here and uh, sitting in the processor and that i is moved into the variable you know register inside r2 and then we are doing an operation called int r2 increment r2 then we are doing the move r1 to r2 and then there is a add r2 so many instructions which are all of them are using the same guy r2 which happens to be a variable i that is actually will be used in the for loop so what happens the arm processor will be trying to get that value d you know i maybe whenever it is written into then it is write into the cache whenever it is to be read it is read from the cache so there are so many read and write are happening okay so one second so sorry so what happens this is being used more often compared to this that's what i'm trying to say this variable was access sometime back and then you know the program is not using it now there is one other variable coming which has so happens to be mapped to the same location now let me change the color uh so this is a variable or some value which has to be mapped to this location because up to this point direct mapping after that it is set as a it can be chosen either you can sit here or here now if suppose in the cache a, a controller okay along with every block if you are maintaining a counter okay counter it's a hardware counter so every time it is being accessed this particular block is accessed it is incremented okay and then similarly there is a counter for this entry so that is also getting incremented but because this has since it came into the cache okay it is a, the incrementing happens for every new block coming into the cache it will be reset to zero and then it will start incrementing from there until a new block comes in occupy the location so now what happens this will have a more count maybe maybe 10 this is having some three assume now when this has to be brought in it is very easy to choose okay this should not be removed so we choose this that means we mean the hardware this says that okay this particular block needs to be evicted now when it has to be evicted it has to do some more things okay if it is uh, a data maybe it would have been modified then it should be written back into the same location the value should be written back into the same location and then this new value will come into this place so this won't be disturbed okay so now what happens this count will become zero now because new entry has come and then whenever it is being accessed it will start increment so this is what happens in a processor inside so you should know when we read something like this what it actually means now you should go back to the program level and then how it is convert you know related to the register level and how it is impacting the accesses to the cache okay and then choosing this so if you have all this in your background or you no know, back of your mind then you will have a better understanding so to the associative the option is to choose one of the entry in fully associative i told you any block in the cache can be picked okay it is not that only you know a particular block in main memory is mapped to one location it is mapped to anything any you know any to any so in that case what happens you can do the same thing but you have a wider option as in earlier in set associative if it is two say two way set associative you have a very narrow option either this or this okay whereas in fully set associative if you are maintaining the same counter like this every block is maintaining a count you can choose the the least count 
and then throw that block into the main memory and then get this new block from there into the application. So, it is easy you have a, a wider choice ok always we want to have a wider choice in any anything in our life as well as in our uh, hardware architecture. So, this is one advantage of having a fully associative mapping. Now, what are the different algorithms ok I mentioned algorithms here. So, there are so many algorithms which can be implemented in hardware please remember it is not that one one exception will happen one software handler will come and then it will execute this algorithm in a program no it is not in software please you no know, uh, we always associate algorithm means it is tied to some software and we write an algorithm in the software this is implemented in hardware ok. So, we cannot have a cache replacement policy in software ok we are bringing cache only to make it faster and then we say that we want to you know execute this algorithm in you know in a software and then come back and then decide oh ok I am choosing this block please evict it you know by the time so many instructions even this executing this handler will involve cache please remember even executing this cache needs cache. So, these things cannot be implemented in software it is all in hardware this uh, I am bringing it to a point because you should have it in mind why it is not possible that is very important to know. So, what is PFO? So, a simple algorithm ok uh, whichever suppose it is well let us for a discussion sake let us assume that it is a fully set fully associative ok this choice please remember the algorithm has to be different way it has to be done for different mapping ok the cache is designed with multiple parameters I told you one of them is how it is mapped whether we have chosen one of this algorithm after that within that we want to say we will look at a replacement algorithm. So, so our set the the number of entries that we are looking at to find out the best suitable block to remove depends on the mapping. So, now in our case I am assuming that fully associated means we have all the blocks in the cache to be a candidate for replacement. In that case how do we decide? We can choose C4 that means what the block which came first ok in terms of time ok C4 means first in first out. So, the first block which has come among the blocks which are there in the tag please remember in terms of time that means what we have to have some count on how many clock cycles have elapsed or maybe how many multiple clock cycles you know it depends on how many bits we are maintaining for each block. So, we there should be some hardware maintained to may you know uh, keep track of time you know when a particular block has come. So, it is not the absolute time it may be some relative you know measurement. So, it is based on the the you know block which has come very early will be evicted. So, what is the, the logic behind it? It is a temporal locality ok. In terms of time the see suppose this is some data entry which has been used maybe time 0 ok. Now, 50 millisecond has elapsed ok nanosecond or uh, ok many second is due ok 500 nanoseconds have elapsed ok. So, many instruction have been executed and then we tend to based on this temporal locality we tend to believe the data or the instruction which have been used most recently will be used in the future too ok that is the temporal locality. So, based on this logic the instruction or a data which was used long time back in terms of time may not be used in the near future. So, if we choose a block which was brought into the cache so late in the in terms of time scale it is not likely to be used in the near future. So, if I take it back and then fill it with a new block I am not going to encounter a miss looking for this block again immediately. This is only an assumption please remember it is not nobody has no uh, wrote it in a check and then or a agreement has been signed that this block will never be used in the near future if it was used long time back no nobody is giving you any assurance, but this is the best probability you know it is all works on probability. So, most probably this is not going to be used compared to the blocks which have been used very recently. So, this if I use this algorithm then I am going to gain benefit based on this 
okay so again whether it is going to be used or not or whether this is going to be used see you may have you may choose the block based on this logic but if there is a possibility that that block is used immediately after that then what will you do you may have to bring that block again back into the cache so it is a investment time investment and a wastage of time so we are trying to optimize it based on the uh, behavior of the software okay so this is one thing now what is random don't give any association just pick up one of the blocks in a random sequence so there may be a random seed okay uh, you know uh, any random generator in a software you can you may have you know seen some um, software libraries you know generating random numbers the random numbers are very much used for so many algorithms you know in a algorithm software world okay for encryption or even to uh, decide about you know where, where you know which where to choose where to save some you no know, keys key generation those things are all based on random algorithm so the randomness is also decided based on some hardware uh, interface okay so maybe a temperature uh, variation in the chip you know or uh, the fluctuation in the clock there are so many uh, hardware logic is used to you know bring in a random phenomena and then generate a no some count maybe a 32 bit or maybe you know random bit mean no more bit you keep it is a more you know safe so maybe 128 bit no some uh, things are maintained inside the hardware and then you no know, it generates a random pattern so if you have such things maybe you can choose the bottom portion of the random number and then decide which was uh, you know which which are the blocks to be chosen i am talking about fully associative so you are having a freedom to choose one of the blocks so we choose one of them and then decide to evict that so that is a one way of deciding a block to evict another one is reach recently used that means you are maintaining a count of this is similar to what i told you so you know if it is not used the counter would have been less okay if it was used recently the count would have been more okay um, so based on the see the, again usage is one thing okay another one is whether it was recently used or not that is the suppose i maintain you know the time stamp of when a particular block in a cache was accessed okay um, i keep updating that you no know, sequentially you no know, for all the blocks i will say that okay this was used is actually time sensitive okay it was used you know in terms of time whether it was used or not that ran no we are ordering the block in terms of usage pattern and then we choose the uh, one which was not used for quite some time so it is the uh, same as with us what i told you uh, just now so the cache controller tracks references to all the blocks and computation proceeds and then increase the track counters when hits are missed after. so if there is a miss then we are trying to choose a particular block if it is a hit we don't even run the replacement algorithm so the replacement algorithm is required only when there is a miss for a particular data and needs to be brought into the cache now when we want to bring into the cache from main memory we are trying to choose one of the blocks to be evicted okay i hope the whole sequence is understood by all of you very good now we have done with the replacement now write policy okay let me uh, you know we are not i intentionally did not talk about this because i know that i am going to be covering this in the in this session so see i we were maintaining on bit valid bit was there and then a dirty bit okay for each of the block please remember all these attributes maintained the counter or the tag okay any attribute maintained for the cache entries are all at the block level okay at a block level it could be 32 bytes or no 64 bytes or no anything any amount okay at a block level these are maintained because why we cannot maintain it at a, no the uh, within that because we are bringing a block whenever we want to get into the cache and then we replace a whole block whenever we write back okay so now what is write policy okay now for us for our uh, 
understanding of this right quality let us assume that it is a data cache what we are talking about. Now the processor ok is accessing the cache element it has come already in the cache so it is reading it it may do two things it may read an entry from here or it may write into the user case maybe I should write right here it may write a particular element into the cache or it may read from the cache. So, ok now when we are writing into the cache ok what happens this element data element it could be a byte or a bird or a, you know a part of the block is written ok the similar location is there in the main memory agree inclusion right because this data whatever was here only was brought into the cache and then later on it saw a hit and then it was trying to access from here and then writing into also it is writing into this location. Now what happens assume that before this particular data element was brought into the cache the value was 10 in this location ok let me change the color uh, again ok the value was 10 here and then the 10 was read by the processor the 10 came into the processor. How did it come? It was doing a LDM LDR ok LDR it was doing R1 comma some address in R2 that address that R2 was pointing was here. So, we brought the whole A you know like Hanuman we brought the whole block from uh, the main memory into the cache though it wanted only a word ok. So, now what happens that 10 also came into this cache and then the 10 was moved into R1 now 10 is sitting in R1 now ok. Now, assume that the processor is executing a add instruction ok R1 comma R2 comma R3 ok uh, sorry uh, again R1 R4 ok. Yeah, sorry about that let me erase it ok. So, R1 what am I trying to do I am adding R1 with R4 uh, assume that R4 is here inside the processor if you are having some value of 5 we have added R4 with R1 and written into the R1 that means 10 is added with 5 and then 15 is written into it after this execution. So, what happened this has become 10 now oh sorry 15 now ok. Now, assume there is a another instruction uh, I am writing it here ok str ok str r 1 comma r 2 assume that R2 is not modified. So, it is still pointing at the same location and then we are trying to write this value that is R1 whatever is there into R1 into R the location pointed by R2. Now, do you think that it will go to main memory it will not because it is already having it here. So, what happens actually is ok this location ok gets written with a value 15 it is not doing a memory write but then what is the use of having a cache. So, 15 is written into cache for doing a str ok instruction storing this value into memory, but as far as the programmer is concerned we are saved it to the memory ok, but actually it has not gone to the memory yet it is in the cache. Now, we have an option who has an option the processor as an option now ok whether to write this immediately or not ok there are so many write policies possible not so many ok 3 uh, I am going to explain you 3 maybe the latest uh, request may have more but what is implemented in ARM and uh, what are what are some you know uh, popularly available write policies are 3 of them. That means you can decide to say I will not write this until this block is going to be replaced because some other block needs to be brought into the cache. Now, I will decide ok 
dirty bit will be set okay please remember dirty bit is actually what this location has become dirty okay actually what is what is mean means what we brought is modified now what we have brought from the main memory is modified no longer it is same so it has become dirty now when we are evicting this block that's what i am saying evicting means we are trying to get a new block into the same location it may be because of any memory mapping algorithm doesn't matter we have chosen this block to be evicted now if the dirty bit is set to maintain the consistency that the originally programmer wanted this to be written into the main memory so we have to oblige the programmer's intent so the processor needs to do what it should do it should write back this value into that location before bringing a new contents from another location into the cache okay it is a temporary storage remember that so it has to be written back so that 15 comes here okay now if we delay the writing here yes, what we are what i am saying is true but suppose i may have another algorithm to say that i will not delay i will write it immediately you may wonder what are what is the use of cache maybe reading i may get a benefit because i will get it from cache but whenever i write because normally reading is more often than than writing okay into the memory assuming you know that is the kind of a, a program flow and that's what is a you know a normal control flow is so we can get the benefit of cache by reading it from cache more often but whenever we do a write into the cache it is also written to the main memory that is one way of deciding another one is i wait till the block needs to be evicted until then i will keep writing into the cache but i won't bother to update the main memory but i will write it only when i need to remove it from this cache so that time i will write that is a delayed writing okay that is one way of doing it and a third way is a write buffer i will talk about the write buffer later okay in subsequently so these are the three things i hope you understood the background of this okay why we are talking about a write policy and where it fits in i think this will make it clear to you now we can go a little faster so when a new data is written into the cache there are three options to choose from regarding the writing the same into main memory so when we say write into the cache means is it written into the cache from main memory or written into the cache from processor good question right which right are we talking about data is written into cache it is not this it is this when we are writing into the cache from the processor okay so it is now what has become it has become dirty the dirty bit is set and we have a choice either write through or write back or write buffer just before okay these are all three names don't worry about uh, you know what they understand you know what they mean i will just explain you now before that i'll ask you one more question that instruction cache need to implement this feature will there be a need to write into instruction memory by the program so what i'm saying is suppose you have a cache which happens to be instruction cache you are you will bring instruction from the main memory right is there a need for you to write into the instruction cache by the program program is writing the program is writing into the program code memory see a program is of a code is writing into a code base you no know, another code area okay there are some possibilities okay um one is you no know, it may be to a memory transfer or maybe a program may find a new content to be written into a program memory so this uh, there are some you no know, uh, the self configurable processes are there where the power of processor configures itself by changing the program okay self configurable processor or another example i could tell you is interpreter the interpreter let me tell you you remember that interpreter i go okay location from 00 to you no know, from the uh, 18 to 4 location for the particular location okay so uh, what happens we are writing the branch to the handler okay this is a reset handler you know there are uh, handlers for data about instruction about all those things so now 
somebody has to write into this location for the processor to access it when the exception happens. Okay, so before that somebody has to write, and this happens to be in the instruction space of the memory. So this part of the addresses will be mapped to the instruction cache. So they will be sitting in the instruction cache. So we may have to write into these locations also at some during the bring up board bring up or no initial reset location reset uh, stages. So yes, very occasionally one example is the write into the interrupt pattern. So this is a just a, you know nothing to do with the write policies. Okay, this is a, a another question I am asking you whether instruction cache also needs to you know implement this policy or not. But mostly it is meant for data cache. Okay, please remember the policies that we decide for a cache may not be same. In the same processor, I may have an instruction cache and then a data cache, and then I may have a policy to say that this is you no, know, there is no write policy, or maybe whenever I have an instruction cache, I may do a write through policy, and then for a data cache, I may have a write back policy. So we can decide different policies. I may have a block size of 32 bytes here, okay, and then I may have a block size of 64 bytes maybe here in the data cache. So so we will treat the instruction or data cache in a different way if it happens to be a split cache. But suppose we have a separate cache for both instruction and data. But if it is a unified cache, then the policies will be uniform across the cache. So these things you should have in mind. I'm just explaining it whenever I am getting an opportunity. So so let us see what these three mean. Okay. Write policy, write through means always write to memory and cache simultaneously. So, when we write into the cache, when the processor writes into the cache, it also writes into the main memory. Okay. Assuming that the uh, writes are more less frequent than reads, then we gain some of some stages out of having a cache. But write through policy does it immediately into the main memory also, it gets reflected. Okay. So, writing into memory is under times lower than cache, which is some approximate number. If there is a frequent rise, okay, it impacts the performance because of the increased bus cycle. And that is very natural, right? If you have a very frequent rise into the data, then we will have a in performance impact. Otherwise, there is a gain. Okay, more more reads are done than more you know compared to write. I hope this is clear to you. Write policy, a write through policy. Another one is write or copy back. Okay, some uh, in literature or uh, the books may refer it as a copy back or write back. So both are same. Write only into cache, but just a dirty bit in block where write was performed. It writes only into the cache, okay, not into the main memory. So for a moment, the value here will be different from the location actually it corresponds to, okay, where it was brought from the main memory. This will be different from this value, okay. But we write into this only. We don't do the you no know, processor doesn't write into the main memory. When a block with a dirty bit is on has to be replaced. Please remember replacement. We are trying to bring another block which maps to the same location in the cache, and we need to now edit this particular block which was corrupted. That means if the dirty bit is set, now we have to write back into the main memory. So it is a delayed write. So this is efficient when there are frequent writes in the frequent writes. That means what the program, the program which is running in the processor, is writing into the data more often. Please remember, it is not write, you no know, modifying any register or something. It is actually yeah, STR or STM is being executed more often. Store is done more often by the program because of that, the memory cycles are created, but it is actually writing into the cache only, so it does not go to the main memory. So, we are saving a lot of space, you know, a lot of time because memory is not impacted at all in the sense it is not accessed at all. So, this data will be different from what is written into this, but when it is to be evicted, that time we will take care of updating the memory. But do you see any issue here? I will show you, I will give you an example where we will have an issue. If this will happen only when there are multiple processors exist in the system. So, this is one processor, okay, P, it is P. Assume there is another processor in the same system, okay. When I have 
in the SOC when we have multiple processor okay the cache may be same okay again there is a design a decision whether to use the same cache or different cache that is different but even if it has a different cache there are is that is not an issue okay let us assume in our case there is a p1 and there is a c1 and there is a c2 cache 2 for this c2 there are two processors but they are having the same memory okay they are working on the same main memory in the same space so now what happens there is a possibility that a data element which is being accessed from this main memory and which is in residing in the cache 1 that means the cache belonging to the processor p1 is acquired by this guy p2 also wants the same location same memory content it wants to read it now what happens if this guy has already updated it and this value is no longer re reflecting the current situation of the data but this guy this processor wants it now so there is a coherency problem this is what is called cache coherency because two different caches are there for different processors working on the same memory space and a memory content is already taken to the cache and then this guy is updating it locally. Now when the other processor wants the same content to be copied, it is having a stale data. This is called stale data in the cache, sorry in the main memory. No longer the data in the main memory is valid. So this is a separate topic. I may need another hour to explain this. So there are cache coherency policies, MSI, okay. Uh, no, uh, there are uh, different policies are used. Um, so we will, that is not our uh, part of the discussion uh, in our uh, class. So we will not talk about it. So what I am saying is, whenever such multiple processes are accessing it, then this policy is a bad choice. Or if you have a choice of this, maybe we need to implement some cache coherency protocols to handle it. Otherwise, write through is a better one. Okay, uh, in the sense it will be immediately reflected in the main memory. So if this guy wants the data, it is already updated. So it can get the up latest updated data from the main memory. So it is write through is a, a write through doesn't need a cache coherency policy. Otherwise, otherwise we need a cache coherency protocol to be implemented. Fine, don't bother about that. Uh, understand that there is a problem when there are multiple processes. Need to take care of cache coherence when multiple processes share the data. Please remember if it is not sharing, no issue. Suppose P1 and P2 are working on a different locations in the main memory, they do not share any data at all, then they will be doing you know only restricting their accesses only to the their own air part of the main memory. So please remember it is main memory, that physical memory needs to be separate they are accessing different part of the main memory then we do not need to worry about you know somebody this guy P1 accessing it and P2 using it the, that kind of situation will not happen okay. I hope this is clear to you. Now what is write buffer? I mentioned this write buffer when we discuss about logical or physical cache let us see writing into the cache also writes into the write buffer. So let me draw a diagram now okay and stick of this blue let me change the color. Okay, cache, this is processor, this is cache, this is main memory. Always I am just, uh, no, you do not get to confuse with what is what. Now, assume that it is a data cache. Now, something coming in between, okay. Who is coming? Oh, color is not so different, but okay, right buffer. This is the inside the processor. Okay, assume this is inside the SOC. The boundary is uh, very much uh, uh, no, required. So, whenever any data is writing written into the block, okay, in a block, please remember, in a block, multiple words are there. N words are there. This write buffer can be a a few words okay it may not be a block size so let us assume that the width of the write buffer is word one word okay in this case let us assume that it is a p4 that means what the latest you know it is like 
what our data is written into is coming here and then it goes out to main memory like this okay so up to this point is split and these are all empty okay some few more empty uh, maybe four entries are here and then some uh, 12 entries are here which are three so write buffer is a hardware okay intermediate buffer whenever a processor does a write into the particular location a may be a word it gets written into the write buffer on so okay both places here as well as here now what happens after that the processor continues with its execution okay so what was written into the write buffer and unless we maintain okay the both the data as well as the address of the uh, data write it has to be there both okay because we might uh, return a you no know, a location which belongs to this location a you know a1 address a1 and then a2 maybe some data is written and then some location a3 address 3 is written so this d1 d2 d3 okay these are all data actually written into this you know what is supposed to have been should go there is written into this now but it is reflected here in three locations in the cache which is reflected unless we maintain this a1 a2 a3 also along with the write buffer entries the write buffer cannot go on write into the proper location it has to know which location it has to write into because writing by this return by the processor at time t okay okay t1 then at time t2 when we later in the time if this is flushed into the main memory so write buffer does it at a different time at different point in time okay so it has to have maintain the um, address also of what is being written written so once it is written then we can the write buffer can you know steal some time okay from the memory cycle is free then it can background it can keep pumping all these fellows out to the data right memory that is what happens in a real processor and our arm processor also support this so the depth of how many words in the write buffer is um you know design dependent particular implementation dependent but the processor supports that i hope this is clear to you i am giving all the examples so that you know exactly what is happening okay so the data comes from here just written into the uh, the cache and then the data bit also may be set because it has to is indicate that it is changed okay but it is not bothering about the write policy is chosen as write buffer okay so it also writes into the write buffer now let me tell you one scenario where the write buffer is not getting any memory cycle at all to pump this values into the main memory when will it happen when the programs you know program is also getting access from the main same bus so program is getting access or maybe new memory cycle is happening okay our co processor is in the you know in the system is accessing the main memory for open or the dna is doing something so there are so many you know uh, the external factors which may impact how the memory is being used by different guys in the system so okay uh, please remember the co processor is inside okay uh, the soc so what happens is the write buffer is not getting time to write into the main memory so in that case what happens the complete write buffer is filled okay uh, it looks very clumsy so let me erase the building uh, let me erase the building so that you know you get a better view so write buffer i'm drawing only the write buffer okay is is filled with lots of values a data value and an address value okay this is d to t and then a to t okay in the c4 order so it is supposed to go to the main memory like this So the processor is writing into this location like this. Now this is all full. Now the write policy for the processor is whenever you do any write into the cache, make sure that you write into the write buffer also. Now what happens? It is full now, full. 
Okay. Now the processor is doing a write. It gets written into the data cache, comes here and then sees that the write buffer is full. Now what happens? It would have been because of some store operation, right? Store instruction getting executed by the uh, processor. Now what happens? This is in the execution stage of the pipeline. Okay, please remember our old friend pipeline is still there. It is getting executed here. Now the processor needs to decide whether to throw this out of the execution side now stage and then move the decode stage instruction which is there next to the execution stage. Now what happens? Since the write buffer is full, the processor decides to you no know, stop this stop pipeline stop. Because if this policy is followed, this is what will happen. So the instruction will wait. Okay, the processor starts means it will now no longer issue any. You know, naturally, see here, you see the side effect. The processor starts because of that there is no fetching of pre-fetching of instruction. Correct. So if pre-fetching doesn't happen, the instruction access is not happening from the main memory. Correct. In that case, what happens? The write buffer will get some cycle to write into the main memory. So these are all kind of uh, you know uh, chain together. The same reaction happens. If you have to have all this in your back of your mind, okay? What happens as a system designer or as a programmer or as a hardware designer? You should know if something happens in the processor when I say pipeline starts. What is the side effect of that? There is no prefetch happening. If there is no prefetch happening, what is the advantage? There is no memory access meant for instruction is happening. It is not reading the instructions from the main memory. Then what happens? The write buffer gets in some few memory cycle. Memory is not busy, so it will write into the main memory. So it will flush this out. Then there will be one space created. It's a FIFO order. So what happens? This whatever was written here will go into this location the last location and this D2 will become D1 so now it will move in move into the pipeline like a C4 then what happens this instruction moves out of this once it is written into the right buffer processor assumes that it is written into the main memory and then it takes the next input. so this is what happens ok. I hope this is clear to you let us see right into the cache writes into the right buffer the memory controller takes care of writing it from the buffer into the main memory. So later on it is later in the time whenever it gets time. Write buffer efficiency depends on the ratio of M1 write to the number of instruction executed. What does it mean? Number of times the SDR kind of instructions are executed. Okay. If it is suppose one out of no maybe 10 or maybe 20 or whatever no number. That means not there are not too many STR instructions in the screen. In that case, you will get a benefit because you are we are the processor is not going to write into the write buffer so frequently. Then the write buffer is likely to get a free memory cycle to flush it. Okay, from the write buffer. So you are gaining from this particular policy. The processor gains as as a system designer we gain. Very good. Let us see. The data written into write buffer is not available for reading until it has executed the write buffer. So, what I mean by that? See, there is a possibility that when the particular data is sitting in the data buffer, write buffer, okay, this is a data cache, okay, an element is here, okay, this is modified and it is sitting here because it was modified, it was a policy write buffer policy, so it is here to be written. It is not in the top of the queue, so some more data needs to be written. Then uh, only this will be written. Okay. Now, what it says is the data written in the write buffer is not available for reading until it has exceeded the write buffer. So the the, the the reason being, I tell you, the possibility. You may see that okay, if it is in the cache, why why should why why can I not read it from here? You have to have it in your back of your mind. The eviction, the replacement policy is a background part, okay. It is another background thing happening. So, there is a possibility of this particular cache entry, okay, is evicted in the sense it was actually written into 
um, write buffer okay when it was in the cache okay and then because of the replacement policy some other data was supposed to come and this is evicted but this earlier address it could be here okay because it is actually you remember write policy is for use for replacement also so it is written into the buffer we can now you do not have to worry about the dirty data or anything okay we can evict this and bring a new data into this okay assume that the same location a new data is brought into the cache okay because we have written into the write buffer process that assume that okay i know it will, it will anyway one day it will go into the main memory okay, not one day so you know within few uh, cycles it will go into the main memory so i don't have to worry about keeping this in the cache so i can flush, flush it out and then bring a new value here now what happens if this is not gone into that we can't no there cannot be a read to the same location which is lying here to be brought from the main memory and then we cannot place it here in another location because it is a fully, fully associative the same location wherever this is pointing it okay this is what is pointing at this location is here we can't bring it to the uh, some other location the stale data because already there is a uh, very most recent data is available here this should go out to the main memory then that should be brought into the cache so it is not available for read until this is flushed out of the write buffer so the processor keeps track of okay um whether a particular entry is there in the write buffer then it doesn't allow the reading to happen so basically what happened suppose ldm ldr is happening okay it's on the same location then this inspection will not proceed okay it will not proceed it will be blocked till this write buffer flushes it and then it, the data is brought from that to the cache to some other location maybe now it will proceed further because the data is brought into the register also wherever it is it is in the cache as well as in the register so it can proceed so that is what happens okay i hope uh, i am explaining more so that you you understand the logic behind it so multiple writes to the same location will leave the lost data written in the location and the other writes are not so what i mean by that one more thing we should remember suppose there is a data here okay b b3 and then you know address is a3 and whenever a write to that location is happening okay in the cache it, it, if it is in the data you know already one entry was there it has gone into the data you know write buffer but it is still not written into the main memory then one more write is happening so the processor is writing into the same location again now what happens the for the same location a new data has come so what it will do the processor will write that new data here also in the write buffer okay anyway it knows that it is in the pipeline to know in the repo to be written into the main memory so it will update it so any intermediate write are reflected in the write buffer but it is not reflected in the main memory okay the intermediate write but the last write will get reflected here that is what i am saying here so if i erase this multiple writes to the same location will leave the last data written in the location and the other writes are lost in the location means in the main memory location only the last write will be left in the main location but intermediate writes are only happening in the write buffer and it is not happening here but as far as the correctness is concerned it is you know the last data is written so no issue okay but it will not be any uh, case when multiple processes are there but i am talking about a single processor so it is not a issue it is called write collapsing or combining or merging write combining or write merging or write collapsing okay so this uh, if you encounter these words remember that it is what is happening is the data is getting written into the write buffer entry but it is not getting into the main memory one uh, when it is uh, due for flushing it comes out with the last data written into that will go to the main memory I hope this is clear to you. If the buffer is full, the processor has to wait. I explained this scenario just now earlier. Okay, now we are going to unified cache. I told you that inspection and data can occupy the same cache. Okay, in that case, what happens? The a particular location, a particular block in the cache can be competing for uh, inspection to be you no know, for an uh, inspection to sit or for a data to sit in the location. So both of them are competing for the possible for a same location okay 
you should it is not uh, you know enough if you know that okay this is a diagram and this is what happened but you should know the background what is actually it means okay see what i when i say that instruction and data competing for the same location in the block what it means when your prefetch is happening that instruction is coming in sitting in one particular block in the cache and similarly when some ldm is happening loading from memory is happening that is also coming and sitting in a cache but both can be mapped to the same location if possible that they will be competing for the same location okay now what happens caches for data and instructions are combined the core and data accesses can affect each other so when they are competing for the same location in the cache they can impact each other okay so it is like uh no our the core which is no actually the core like ldm or stm is also a core okay actually an instruction when you are executing this when you are accessing this instruction it is going to create a instruction cache kick or miss correct it is this instruction is accessed in the pre fetch state and after some three cycles when it enters the execution state it is going to create a an issue with the data cache because it is going to create a memory read or memory write so that is going to cause a, again a, a disturbance to the cache so an instruction which is okay three clock behind can come and cause a disturbance to the cache okay so they are dependent so load and store instructions can cause structural hazards because cache is common for so when i what i mean the structural hazard if the blockage is happening maybe a pipeline is stalled because the particular block okay is not available or you no know, there is a miss so it has to be brought from the main memory so it is a structural hazard that's what is happening so the load and store instruction can cause a structural hazard okay very good and the split cache doesn't have an issue because they have a separate you know uh, physical caches and i told you that it can be different size and different block and it can be of uh, different write policy uh, you know you can do anything okay independent of each other okay so you can design this and design this independent of each other based on the requirement of a particular program running in the process okay so that's what it's a split cache so cache for data and instructions are separate both caches can be configured differently and they can be accessed in parallel yes, that is very very important they can be accessed in parallel okay a one entry in an instruction cache may not or will not not may not will not impact the instructions in other cache okay there may be a dependency okay yeah, something happening here may have an effect on yeah, some network is happening here okay there is a side effect may be there but it is not that one entry here it is not as tied to the unified cache case okay the same instruction can try to emit a particular block but what is happening here will have a side effect here because if suppose instruction ldm is happening then there will be a, a data entry coming here okay that way there is some uh, no dependency but actually the access to the cache of this and this are misses happening here and it is happening here or whatever they are independent of each other so they can be accessed in parallel so when a prefetch is happening it is going to access from this see that is one more important thing you should remember when in, when i am saying it is in parallel means the prefetch happening will be this you know will be making the instruction cache busy whereas any execution happening here will be keeping the data cache busy so they can be in parallel okay so that's the advantage of having a split cache so what are the multiple level caches there can be number of caches in the system so in an soc we can have i so far i showed you only one cache because we want to explain what are the policies design elements or associated with the cache then once you are now clear with one cache now i can introduce one more cache this is level 1 plus l2 cache i am showing it as both are inside the cache now size wise i need to show that l2 cache is bigger than l1 cache and it will be a multi block this suppose this is the 8 kilobyte of cache this can be a 16 kilobyte or 16 kilobyte okay 
and the main memory can be a few hundreds of kilobytes or megabytes. So, what happened? Actually, the L1 and L2, L2 cache is a cache for L1, okay. So, it is just a scenario, okay. For the processor, L1 is a cache. Similarly, for L1, L2 is a cache. Suppose if the processor tries to find something here, it may encounter a mess, then it will come and see whether do I have it here because this is the biggest size, right? So, maybe previous success that cache the entry was here and then it is still lying here because it is a bigger thing. The replacement will be replacement will be more often here compared to L2 cache. So, replacement, okay. That means any block going out and getting replaced. So, if you do not find it here, you are likely to find it here. Then what happens? It is brought into this immediately. And this is said that okay, I am you know, uh, this is being used here. So, there will be a separate policy for this and separate policy for this. What I mean by that is it can be different, but the kind of size what we decide in the system has to be a multiple of element. Okay. So, what is the advantage we get? If there is a miss here, we can try to see whether it is available here instead of immediately going to the main menu. If it is not in L2 also, then what happens? It is brought from main memory. So, when a new block is brought from main memory, what happens is it gets actually a yeah, bigger block is here, ok. The sizes of blocks may be different, ok. The block size may be 32 bytes here, ok, and 64 bytes here. As I told you, as we go away from the memory, the transport, the number of bytes we transport will be more bigger. So, when we need only 32 bytes, it is a miss here, ok, it is not available here and the same location is not available in this. Now, what happens L2 see no longer L1 is communicating with the memory, L2 is communicating with memory because that is closer to the memory. So, L2 says I want to 64 bytes of you uh, know data around this location ok, which is aligned to 8 byte or 4 byte or whatever. Then that data is drawn to the cache and part of it based on what part of the 64 byte is required by this processor, processor may need one word or one byte from here. So, based on that a part of this location is copied into this location and then given to the processor ok. So, what happens when this processor is accessing the next maybe another location which is closer to 32 byte, it is not here this block is not here because only 32 bytes are sorry uh, yeah 32 bytes are available here whereas the next subsequent value might be here because we brought 64 bytes from here. So, when it encounters a miss here it is likely to find a hit here. So, now what happens it will bring the next set of 32 bytes here and then maybe it can replace the previous one. So, that it does not have to touch other blocks. So, now what happens we are gaining a hit because of having a L2 cache. So, that is the scenario of how L2 cache might save us from going to the main memory more often ok. So, split caches. So, L1 cache can be on chip or L2 cache may be on or off chip. Normally, L1 is a split cache ok, whereas L2 cache can be a unified or split cache. What I mean by that? The instruction and data ok of L1 cache may be dif different caches ok, whereas L2 cache uh, bigger cache L2 may be common both both D1 and L1, L1 will be this is unified ok and then this is communicating with the main memory ok and processor of course talks to these two days. Good I hope you understand when you see any processor architecture internal diagrams or blocks you should be able to relate more. So, L1 cache always maps the contents in L2 ok this is very important. L2 cache size is normally in multiples of L1 cache. I told you that ok that is all. So, what are the difference between parameters? Now, if you see each of the elements you should have very good clarity and familiarity and not only familiarity you should also understand that. you know that map by now ok that associative and fully associative I call it a scan because it is a 
accessing the cache with the full associative mapping is CAM, okay, content based addressing. So, content addressing, okay. And you know replacement policy, it can be round robin or random or LRU, LRU is what, least recently used, you know the right policy now, okay, doesn't it look very familiar and uh, you know about unified or separate caches and you know about physical cache and virtual cache, uh, just to refresh your memory, processor is here and uh, MMU which I am going to talk in the next class, okay, and MMU memory, main memory is here. Now, cache can be here or here. What is this? This is the virtual address and or logical address, and this is the physical address that they will be converted. So, cache can be either here or here, it is not both places, either one of these places. And if it is here, it is logical cache, and if it is here, it is a physical cache. What does it mean? It maps the logical cache, logical addresses to the entries in the cache. Whereas this cache maps the physical addresses generated by the MMU to locations in the cache. That's all. Okay. So you understand this two also. So you understand all the entries here. Okay. If you don't, please go back either one lecture in this lecture itself or go back one more lecture. Okay. Now on cache features, features, I am not sure whether you will be able to read them all, but you can refer any manual. Uh, these are all different word sizes 8 or 32 ok, it could be logical or physical location and the two way set associative I told you two way, four way, eight way, but there are 32 way, 64 way processes you know caches are there that means what directly map to the cache, but inside that it could be in one of the locations suppose if it is a 64 way cache it could be one of the 63, 0 to 63, 64 locations in the cache in the particular uh, directly mapped line it could be found in one of these locations ok. So, there are different families of processor ARM 720, ARM 920, strong ARM, ARM 11 and then data or in media you know instruction cache how much of size 32 kilobyte or 8 kilobyte there are different sizes cache line size you no know, block size 4 or 8 you no know, words 4 words means 4 into 4 bytes. So, 8 words maximum you can see that only 32 bytes are there ok, but later processors will be in that, but it is a block size or, or line size of the cache. So, it can be you can see that uh, kind of uh, different values given to each of the elements. So, we have addressed each of them in detail, so you should be an expert in cache now ok. Now, we have talked about cache inside the processor, let me del just give you uh, some more time 10 minutes listen to it ok, cache is here, let us for a moment forget about MMU which is not in our uh, purview now, cache is here ok. So, if there is no MMU what is the type of cache here, it is a physical cache ok, because there is no MMU. So, whatever address given by the processor is physical address and physical memory. So, in this case I told that the first you know, cache can be configured, configured in the sense I can configure it for right policy, some things are divided in the hardware, but sometimes what happens is the hardware is configurable. So, because when the IP is given of an I, you know cache controller they cannot design one uh, IP for a particular type of a policy ok, then it is it is not an IP right. So, cache controller will have a configurability in it that means you can choose write through policy ok or write back policy one of the right policies I can see ok or I can choose uh, you know the memory mapping policy I can choose one of them. Once you choose a particular set then it may remain as same throughout the execution of the program, but the choosing a particular configuration is or you, you can even you know you can choose the IP and then uh, have that only limited security in the system so that no your SOT is limited that is fine, but sometimes you may want to give the configurability to the system programmer in that case what happens is. Uh, the configurability is given to the programmer ok, I do not know what ok. Uh, so, now what we will do is 
we will see what are different co-processors. It is actually considering the co-processor. Now, cache is done by co-processor. Why? Why co-processor? See, cache controller itself is considered to be a co-processor mapped to this particular ID, co-processor ID. The reason being, accessing the co-processor is not a memory cycle. Okay, please remember, it is nothing to do with the memory access. Okay, and they are not so. Whenever you do a memory access only, the cache controller comes into play, MM comes into play, and then we, when we are saying that we are configuring a cache, if it is the configurability is also is mapped to the main memory or memory map, if those registers are also memory map similar to peripherals, then we are in trouble because we cannot configure the memory or the cache or the main MMU. So MMU also can be, you know, needs to be configured. So, whenever we want to configure any of them, they can't be in the memory map. That means it can't be in the 2 power 32 locations that can be addressed by the ARM processor. I am talking about only 32 by the processor. So, they can't be in that location. So, the ARM designers have you know, nicely designed in such a way that the controller of cache or the controller of MMU configuring it is mapped to the co processor. That means what? We can use those co processor instructions that we have seen, MRP, MCR, okay. Only these two, okay. MRP, MCR is what? Either co processor to register, one of the ARM register, or register to co processor. So, ARM inside the register, some contents can be written and then it can be written into the cache controller. So, you have to assume the cache controller, see, cache is here what we have seen so far. Cache controller is a totally a different element which is associated with a cache. So, I let me call it as a cache controller. So, this is mapped to the coprocessor world. So, it is mapped to coprocessor 15. So, if a processor throws some instruction with a coprocessor ID 15 and then it conveys some particular location, then what happens? The coprocessor controller gets written which happens to be a, you know, based on the number you choose, you can be a cache controller, then what happens, cache gets configured. Then when you do any memory access, it will be accessed from the cache. So, you may wonder where this, this MRC and MCR instructions come from, they come from instruction memory, the instruction memory is also in the, so it is nothing, it is not independent of memory because the instructions are sitting in the memory. So, they have to be mapped without the cache. So, these are all you know, non cached items. Okay. These some part of the initial memory which is accessed for configuring this cache controller in MMU, they are all non cached. So, these instructions are non cached, so they can be directly accessed. So, cache will not be coming into play at all. And then the processor will configure the cache, then it will enable the cache. Okay. That is the flow of things which you will be having a better understanding when I talk about MMU. But in this case, you remember that the caches are also also to be configured using co-processor instructions and there are 32 bit registers that programmer can write into or read from. Overall system control configuration can be done using them, cache configuration can be done and this is all different tightly coupled memory MMU and MPU, ok. Do not worry about them, I will talk about it later in the subsequent chapters. So, apart from cache management, where is the cache? The coprocessor 15 is also used for configuring other controllers. So, that is not our uh, topic of discussion in this section. So, you should know that cache controllers are designed or sorry, configured using these, you know, con coprocessor instruction. So, they need to be enabled only when the configuration is done for the cache. Till then, the instructions are accessed from a non cached part of the memory. So, that part of the memory which is holding the instructions for configuring the cache are accessed without the cache getting involved. So, ARM can directly access the main memory and then do the job. If you know this, if you can understand this particular background, I am happy. Okay. So, we will cover these things later. Now, co processor 15 registers. Please remember these are all the some primary registers. That means if you recall the instruction, 
if I am calling it as MRC, there is a uh, CPID somewhere here, I think, okay, 8 to 15, if I remember something. So, CPID, the broadcaster ID is in the instruction like this, and then there are some operands we talked about, okay, operands which are actually the coprocessor registers, okay, coprocessor COC registers. So, what I am talking about primary registers and secondary registers are this OC1, operand 1 and the operand 2. So, you have a 15 bit main, no sorry, not 15 bit, 4 bit. So, 0 to 15, so 16 coprocessor registers can be accessed. So, these numbers are varying from 0 to 15. So, you can access them using these operands and then mention the CPID as what 15 with a CPID coprocessor 15 and told you then we can do different job ok. So, it is all designed and given by the ARM only this coprocessor controllers are ARM IP means IP coming from ARM that is why they have designed that ok this is the registers I will be using to configure them. So, in your SOC if you have a cache you will have a cache controller along with that. So, you will write these registers and then configure according to the instructions ok what needs to be written into then you know if the cache will behave that way ok. So, this is how the configuration of cache happens. Now, what is a flash cache line drop ok these are some jobs ok I am explaining clean and flash I think it is better to understand this. Flashing a cache means suppose you want you have so many data, so much of data is there in the cache and then the processor is restarting ok reset is given then you can decide to do a flush. Flush in the sense all the entries in the cache are made invalid and even if there are dirty entries here they are not written into main view ok they are not written into main view. Invalid block without writing back the dirty block into main view ok if there was a write back policy which you know which was a you know delayed right. So, it was not write through. So, but some entries were there which needs to be written in the main memory, but when the processor is starting there is no need to write them all right. So, you can there is one scenario there may be many scenarios where you do not want to write this data into the main memory. So, plus is one control ok one command you can give it to the control of cache clean cache is another command you can give it to the cache. So, these are all required when there are the process context which are happening ok uh, P 1 is you know executing in the processor now P 2 is coming into the ARM processor. Now, whatever was used by the P 1 needs to be written back into the main memory and then so that P 2 can start using the processor and then start using the cache also. So, for that you need to clean the cache. So, clean the cache means if suppose there are dirty entries in the cache it should be written back to the main memory. So, one controller one command can be given to the cache so that it writes back everything into the main memory ok. So, I am just giving you the scenario lockdown in the sense not allowing selected blocks from replacement. See there is a maybe a you know see there is a need for some part of the cache ok some two blocks are there can be locked out ok this is cache can be locked out it could be instruction cache the sense suppose you have ok or FIQ ok FIQ uh, FIQ vector the FIQ vector is pointing to some location in the main memory which is the handler FIQ handler it is here in this location assume that these instructions are all mapped to this location in the cache and then you want to say that they should be locked down what I am telling you is whenever the ARM process is executing ok it will be using the for its own activity it will be using this instruction cache for its program whenever an FIQ happens ok interrupt it may be an you know external interrupt coming from outside world then it has to go to the interrupt vector and then access the handler. Suppose if all the instructions meant for FIQ are all in the cache system it will not go to main memory it will get the handler and then everything in the cache cache itself. So, FIQ can be executed the sense handler can be executed without any delay because the all the instruction meant for handler are all available in the cache ok. It will be happening only when the replacement 
doesn't happen for these blocks. So you can lock down saying that don't even consider any blocks appearing in this cache block to be for replacement. So replacement happens only within these locations and these locations are not not replaced so it happens. Okay, so you can run faster. So that is the purpose of this lockdown. I hope you understood all this. Uh, so we covered quite a lot about cash in this and we may not be talking about cash anymore and uh, by now I think you have a better understanding of cash and you can read more literature. Please do not stop with this. Go and read some literature, some uh, uh, books to have better understanding and clarity. Okay, You may you have to internalize whatever you hear from this. So reading more will help you to streamline your thoughts and understand them better. Okay. I, I enjoyed really sharing this with you. I hope it was useful. Talk to you in the next class. We will talk with we will start the next class with the NME with your memory. Okay. Thank you very much for your attention. See you in the next class. Have a nice day. Bye bye.